Well, good morning and welcome to the gathering at 10.30 at Glenbrook. And to those of you who are joining us online, welcome. It's so lovely that you are able to join us so that we have the technology and the people who are running that for us week by week so that those who can't get here can still join with us. It's great that that can happen. Well, Easter's been and gone. I don't know about you, but for me, it was really a time to reflect again on the price that God paid. Not just the price Jesus paid in dying on the cross, which was enormous, we know that, but the price his father paid in allowing his son and sending his son and knowing what would happen to his son and actually decreeing that that's what would happen so that you and I could spend eternity with him. Uh, it, it was a good time of reflection and I hope it was for you and reminded us again of where our faith lies in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. We're starting a new sermon series this morning in Isaiah and I hope as you came in you received one of these uh, handouts which uh, give you some sort of an overview on, on where we're heading. The historical context is a time of spiritual decline for the people of Judah, seen in the life of Uzziah who mostly did what was right in the eyes of the Lord but then ended his life with leprosy under a curse from God. God sees the sin of Judah, yet reasons with them to turn back to him. And I hope through this series that as we come to see God's judgment on his people, that we'll also understand that's the same God who paid the price for the sinfulness of those people. And that we will focus on who we are in Jesus more than we'll focus on what that judgment looks like. We're going to sing our first song and I want to read the verse of the first song out to you so that, that because it actually um, picks up what the, the, this series is on about. The song is Christ is mine forevermore and the first verse is this. Mine are days that God has numbered. I was made to walk with him. Yet I look for worldly treasure and forsake the king of kings. But mine is hope in my redeemer. Though I fall, his love is sure. For Christ has paid for every failing. I am his forevermore. Would you please stand as we sing our first song?
Please be seated. And all the kids, anyone under anyone under 99, welcome up the front. 99? 99? Oh, 99. Come on down. Here we go. Now, you may have mentioned, you may have heard mentioned, we're starting a new series on Isaiah. And the first uh, things about Isaiah is talking about what does God do? expect us to be in his people you know and when we think about that we think about that god knows exactly who we all are and that's why the words are written in isaiah that we need to turn back to god and say sorry because god knows what's in our minds what's in our hearts he knows that I wonder how come he knows that how does he know that well, I know, who's been to the doctor lately? Who's been to a doctor? Oh, there's a few, okay. <laughs> oh, the 98-year-old children. <laughs> you see, when sometimes you go to the doctor and things aren't right, they need to take a look inside you. But they can't sort of sit there. So if I go like here to Elijah and look real hard, I can't really, I can see hair, but I can't see what's going inside. So sometimes the doctor might need to get what they think is an x-ray. What can you see on this x-ray? What can you see? Sorry? The spine? Yep. What else? What can you see? Lungs. And if you look real carefully, you might be able to see rib cage, yeah. You might be able to see something that goes tick, 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 boom, tick, 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 boom. Oh, no, I was thinking it might have been a mobile phone. No, 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 their heart. But see, the Bible talks about God can see what's in our hearts. He also knows what's in our minds. Now, how can God see that? Well, he made us. And, you know, here's a picture. Now, I wonder if you can see what one of these are. Who knows what one of these are? Skulls and brain. A brain. 
Yeah, mouth and a throat, that's a person's head. And shows they've got a brain. Here, Elijah, just help me. Have a, have a look in. Can you see my brain? Oh, not really. Oh, what? I don't, have a better look. It's there. No, it's not. not. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, it's on the, oh, it's the other side. All right. Have a look at that side. Can you see? Can you see hair and skin? Well, at least you can see hair. That's a, I feel better already. But see, God can see all of those things about us because he knows what we're like on the inside. And when he knows, that, yeah, like those people of Israel when Isaiah was writing to them, they were doing things that didn't please him. And we often do things that don't please him. Things like we might tell lies. We might get angry at people. We might actually say to God, no, I don't want to do what your Bible says. I want to do what I say. The Bible calls that, it's a three-letter word. Who knows what it is? Sorry? Sin. And you know what's the biggest thing about sin? What's the middle letter? Right. Sin is all about what I want to do, not what God wants to do. So this book about Isaiah is all telling us what we need to be doing to love God and to serve him better. Now, to help us with that, we're going to sing a song, and you might remember this one, and it's up on the screen. Now, it's up on the screen, and the song words are going to be there too. There it is. Now, most of you probably remember this one from when you were a little bit less than 99. So some of you guys down the front, you might know this one. If you do, now what I think we all should do, we should stand and I think some of the older kids, like you guys, do you know the actions? Come on. Yeah, it's pr- yeah. Okay, we'll turn around so you can show all the others. Ready? Here we go. Ready? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Love all of mankind as you would love yourself and love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and mind and love all mankind. We've got Christian lives to live, we've got Jesus' love to give, we've got nothing to hide because in we are by love. Now I think I think there's actually a pretty good group here. We might do it as a round. Do you know how rounds work? The difference between knowing and being able to do it. <laughs> Hold on, let's have a look at the brain in there. Let's just show. Oh, no, you're all right. You've got one in there. Okay. So what we might do is all the, those less than 99. <laughs> we might do all the ones in the front here as the first group. And we'll do all the other people in the back there as the second group. But you're going to have to stand for this, though, because you're going to have to do the actions, too. So are you happy to lead in the second group? I can lead in the second group. Right. Sorry? Possibly. <laughs> Possibly. Hold on, let me just check. We'll, we'll check how Let me just check. Hold is. on. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, he's okay. He's got one. This could, have been, this could have been his picture. I wonder if it's the same one. Hold on. It's, it's a match. <laughs> it's a match. <laughs> All right, here we go. Three, one, two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And love all of mankind as you will love yourself and love the Lord your Lord God with your all your heart and all your soul and your heart. And all your soul and mind as you will love yourself and kind. We've got Christian lives to live, we've got love to give, we've got nothing to hide because in him we are by love. Lord, the God, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your mind. Because in him we are by love. Great. Thank you, everyone. It's a movie.
So get in touch if you'd like to help with Holiday Club. So it's time for Kids Church now. Sparks, that's preschoolers. Off you go. Embers, K to two. You're going the same way. Up you get, go. Crossfire, off you go. Year six to eight. And flame, you should still be seated because I haven't told you to move yet. All right, off we go. Friends, we've got some really talented people in this, uh, this gathering that we have together here. I thought that video was put together. We, Tim Robinson does a lot of our videos, and, and Tim is professional in that, but Rachel did that one herself. So really, really good to see how we communicate. Again, welcome, and especially if you're new here, it's lovely to always be able to say welcome. I hope that you will be able to meet up with some of our people after the church, enjoy a cup of tea or coffee, and uh, perhaps a biscuit or a scone or something like that. When you came in also, you would have received one of these leaflets. Two things on there to do with uh, ministry matters. One is the Mission Prayer Night, which is on the 29th of April up at our Blackston Centre. And that's an opportunity to come and pray together uh, for those mission partners who are working um, for the gospel's sake uh, on our behalf. But the other one on there is a Gary Haddon thank you lunch. Why are we saying thank you to you, Gary? You're leaving. If you guys, if you hadn't understood, Gary's been one of our, our I missed that, what was that? Thank you, Thank you for leaving. I hope that's not it. I trust that's not it. Um, Gary's been a part of our ministry team here for the last two and, uh, two and a bit years and Gary is moving on to a, a new role within the diocese where he'll be working alongside two of the bishops um, in what's called an archdeacon role and we get the chance to say goodbye to Gary and Julie this morning except... We're saying goodbye to Julie, who's not leaving, which is really an interesting thing to do, because Julie's going to be staying on as part of, part of our church family here. But thank you, Lunch. Please stay if you can. If you've brought something with you to share, that would be great. Uh, that'll be on at 12.30 immediately following morning tea this morning. The sermon series, as we've said, is a new series in Isaiah, and there's a short two-minute video uh, for us to watch now as an introduction uh, to this series. morning. My name is Andrew. Uh, I'm going to be reading with you from the book of Isaiah, 
chapter 1, if you have a church Bible, that's on page 680. If you have your own Bible, it's around about the centre of the Bible. The book of Isaiah, chapter 1, from verses 1 to 20. This is also on the handout that you received today. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear me, you heavens. Listen, earth. For the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with olive oil. Your country is desolate, your cities burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. Daughter Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you? this trampling of my courts. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient... You will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is God's word. Scary. 
when all the light of day is gone and we can't see and our fears and our anxieties can really take over. This song is a combat against us. It's a rem a, for us, it reminds us that God is with us even in the night time and we can call out to him. So please stand with us and sing the night song. My name is Alex. I am going to be reading from Isaiah, following directly on from where Andrew just read. So Isaiah, starting in chapter 1, verse 21, and going through to chapter 2, verse 4, and it's found on page 680 of the Church Bibles. See how the faithful city has become a prostitute. She was once full of justice. Righteousness used to dwell in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your choice wine is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, partners with thieves. They all love bribes and chase after gifts. They do not defend the fatherless. The widow's case does not come before them. Therefore the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the Mighty One of Israel declares, Ah, I will vent my wrath on my foes and avenge myself on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove all your impurities. I will restore your leaders as in the days of old, your rulers at the beginning. Afterward, 
You will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion will be delivered with justice, her penitent ones with righteousness. But rebels and sinners will both be broken. And those who forsake the Lord will perish. You will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks in which you have delighted. You will be disgraced because of the gardens that you have chosen. You will be like an oak with fading leaves, like a garden without water. The mighty man will become tinder and his words will spark. Both will burn together with no one to quench the fire. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream into it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may, be, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word from the Lord, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Well, I hope you're ex as excited to start looking into Isaiah as I am. A biography of my great something grandfather starts with the words, some men are only the shadow of a mighty name. How is it that a man who would boast that his father was a lieutenant colonel, his uncle a colonial chief justice, his great uncle a general in the army and an Irish baron, how is it that he would die penniless in Australia? How is it possible to become just the shadow of a mighty name? It's the question we ask of God's people in Isaiah as well. See, God's people were rescued from slavery in Egypt and brought into the promised land by God, a land flowing with milk and honey. They were blessed abundantly by him. He gave them his presence in the temple. He gave them victory over their enemies. He gave them peace and prosperity. And this is a heritage greater than anyone can imagine. Yet Isaiah shows us they are but a shadow of a great nation. They are not who they once were. Now Isaiah is writing at a specific time in history to a specific people. See verse 1? The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. He is writing to a people that are but a shadow of a mighty name, a people in decline. For things have been going quite well, for God's people, but now they're in religious decline. They don't worship God the way he wanted. They're in social decline as they embraced corruption and injustice. And they're in military decline as the nations around encroach on their land. And how did they end up there? Because of pride. Because in their pride, they placed themselves above God. And they don't trust him. So they do things their way, not God's way. It's the story of God's people in Judah and Jerusalem. And it's the story of King Uzziah as well. In whose reign the book of Isaiah begins. So Uzziah was a good king. And he depended on God. He trusted in God. And the nation of Judah had great wealth and success under his reign. And it seemed everything was going well. 
As long as Uzziah trusted the Lord, God gave him success. He rebuilt towns. He fortified cities. He won wars. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He entered the temple and he burnt incense on the altar. And this seems like a good thing, right? But this was something only the priest was allowed to do. In his pride, King Uzziah wanted to come to God on his terms, not on God's terms. He wanted to worship God his way, not God's way. And so 80 priests just poured into the temple, you know, begging him to stop. And Uzziah, he raged at them. And as he was trying to light the incense, leprosy, a contagious skin disease, incurable skin disease, just broke out on his head. He was struck with leprosy. And he lived the rest of his life in isolation. And the rule of the country was given to his son. This is the context into which Isaiah is speaking God's word. He is speaking to a sinful people. And a key question, which God's word through the prophet Isaiah explores is, how will this sinful nation, this sinful people, how will they become a restored people? But more than that, how will this this sinful people bring blessing to the whole world? Because that was their purpose. That's what God's chosen people were supposed to do. God chose these people to be in relationship with him. And then they were supposed to show God's goodness to all the nations around them. This was God's plan to bless the world. His plan was to choose one people. Here the people of Israel, referred to as Judah and Jerusalem, and bless them so that they can be a blessing to others. But the gap between who they were meant to be as God's chosen people and who they were, was immense. And it begs the question, how will God bring blessing to the whole earth through his people when they are a shadow of who they should be? As Isaiah writes, and we're going to work through the passage, so follow along if you've got your Bible in front of you. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. How will God bring blessing to the whole earth through his people when they don't know him? They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. How will God bring blessing to the whole world through his people when they've turned their backs on him? Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. Now, God's people, right, they're supposed to bring blessing to all nations, to the whole world. They're supposed to be holy, that is set apart, made different by God and for God, different to the nations around them. And they're supposed to attract the nations in. Like in the Old Testament, we see that with King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. She hears about his wisdom. She hears about his glory. She wants to know more. So the nations come in. But here, in Isaiah's time, instead of attracting the nations in, God's people are attracted by the nations. And so become sinful like the nations around them, rebelling against God, given to corruption, spurning God, the Holy One of Israel. And instead of wanting to see the wisdom and glory of God's people, the nations come to plunder and steal. God's people are failing in their purpose. They have forgotten their purpose as they they have forgotten their God. They're so far from whom they should be that God calls his people Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not just that they, that they aren't being who they should be, but it's that they're the most evil of all the nations. And so instead of bringing blessing to the nations, they have come under God's judgment like the nations, like Sodom and Gomorrah, who were, 
who God destroyed because of the evil that was done there. A shadow of a mighty name. And it begs the question, how will God bring blessing to all the nations through his people when the nations are ransacking his people? In their pride, God's people who were supposed to worship him with fewer hearts instead indulge in false religion that's all about them, worshipping God on their terms, not on his terms, going through the motions but without the heart of love. And so God doesn't listen to his people. He doesn't want their meaningless offerings. He doesn't want their detestable incense. Why? Look at the end of verse 15. Can you see it? Your hands are full of blood. How will God bring blessing to the whole world through his people when their hands are full of blood? And it seems here that the cause is lost. It seems that God's people are beyond saving. But then in verse 20, a promise of hope. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. In the midst of judgment, we have a promise of hope. God will restore his people. God will bring blessing to the whole world through his people. God will keep his promises. For God knows what the people of Israel and Assyria, what they don't know yet, but that by the end of the book, they're going to know this, but they don't know it now. God knows what they don't know, that his hands will be bloodied so that their hands can be made clean. He calls on them to wash themselves but knows they will only ever be made clean by him. He calls on them to stop doing wrong, but knows this will only be made possible by him. He shows them his hatred of sin, but knows that only he will be able to destroy sin forever. God will restore his people. God will bring blessing to the whole world through his people. God will keep his promises. His hands will be bloodied so that their hands are made clean. Every day a farmer walked out to his fields. The sun scorched down on him and the rain never came. And every day he walks out to his field. And every day he watches his crops fail. The only water is tears of desperation. Then one day as he's walking out to the field, the hot wind blows the soil away and he sees a glimmer of light. Something he's never seen before. It's rocky, yellowish, and he had a glimmer of hope for he thought this might be gold. So he picks it up and he runs to the blacksmith who laughs at the ignorant farmer bringing in a rusted piece of junk. The blacksmith mockingly throws it into the fire. The humiliated and dejected farmer goes to leave when the blacksmith cries out in surprise, for the rust has faded. The dirt and the outer shell has burnt away and what remains looks like a silver key. And grabbing his tongs, the blacksmith rescues it from the fire and he hammers the bent metal back into shape. And amidst the banging and crashing, amidst the heat of the fire, he restored a precious key. Its impurities removed, its shape corrected. So the man returned to where he had found it, to that first glimmer of hope. And he found a chest filled with treasure greater than he can imagine, unlocked by the key refined by fire, that had been restored, made clean and purified, that now brought blessing to the whole impoverished town. 
Isaiah has given us a glimmer of hope. But it is hope covered in dirt and dross. For as he goes on to say, your silver has become dross. God describes his people as silver that has become dross. Silver that's become worthless, dirty, that's full of impurities, that's, that's lost its value and use, that no longer shines as it's meant to shine. It's a picture of God's people, once meant to shine for the entire world, now full of impurity and no good to anyone. So we ask the question, how will God bring blessing to the whole earth through his people when they're a shadow of who they should be? And it's the same as asking the question, how will silver that has become dross and is full of impurities be made pure. And the next part of the chapter shows us the answer. And it's also a summary of the whole book. So if you're going to write something down, write this down. God will bring salvation through judgment. God will bring salvation through judgment. This is the answer to the question of how God will restore his people and bless the world. Salvation through judgment. The silver will be burned and purged. Salvation will come through judgment. They will be purged to remove their impurities. Because that's how you get dross out of silver. You burn it off. You heat up the metal and the impurities rise to the top and then you scoop it off. Therefore the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the Mighty One of Israel declares... I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove all your impurities. Amidst the heat and crashing of the blacksmith's furnace, God's people will be purified. Judgment is never easy. But God's judgment is good. For it purifies what is impure. It gives worth to what is worthless. It restores what is broken and it brings blessing to the whole world. For God brings salvation through judgment. But there's a problem. No one wants the heat turned up. We want salvation without judgment. We want to be the pure silver without having the impurities removed. And this is a prophecy for God's people of Judah and Jerusalem and how he's going to work to save all people, like save all who come to him in salvation history. But it has a challenge for us. Are we willing to say that God's corrective work in our lives, which we often really don't like at the time, Are we willing to say that it's a good thing? Do we so hate sin as God hates sin? Do we so love God and his holiness that we want him to work in our lives and discipline us as his children to transform us to be more like him? As we read Isaiah we will be challenged over and over and over again to go, hang on, maybe there's a bigger picture here. Maybe like the Bible promises, God God is working all things for the good of those who love him, even when the heat is turned up, even when our sin is exposed, even when the impurities are being burned out. As the hammer of God's discipline comes down on our lives, as the fire of God's corrective hand is heating up, do we really believe that he is working everything for our good? That like he would transform his people in the Old Testament so that they could bring blessing to all nations, he is transforming us into the image of his son so that we can be more like him 
and share his love with the world. Are we willing to say that God's corrective work in our lives is good? And are we able to listen to it? Or is anything that that makes us feel uncomfortable or that disrupts our comfort automatically bad? As we get older, without the corrective work of God in our lives and the transforming work of the Holy Spirit, we become caricatures of ourselves more stubborn, more unwilling to listen, more set in our ways. How did my great something grandfather become a shadow of a great name? Because he was unwilling to hear correction. So when he was dismissed from the Navy for murdering a fellow officer, he didn't bother to fix his temper. Because he was too proud to ever be wrong. So when he was kicked out of the Cape Colony for dueling and lost his income down there, he didn't bother to learn to respect authorities that he considered beneath him. How did King Uzziah become a shadow of a great name? Because he was unwilling to hear God's correction and the correction of the priests. He didn't want a bar of it. He wanted to do things his way, on his terms. How did Judah and Jerusalem become the shadow of a great nation? Because they turned their backs on the Lord. May this never be said of us. May God's corrective work in our lives lead us to depend on him more, to know him better, to be more like him, even though it's hard. It is hard. But we can say God's corrective work is good now, and we can say that God's judgment is good forever, because God brings salvation through judgment. He will bring salvation through judgment. Then, in Isaiah, in the punishment of the people and the preservation of the remnant, now, through the victory Christ has won for us on the cross, where justice and mercy meet, where evil is used for good, where salvation is brought through judgment. Judgment is never easy. But God's judgment is good, for it purifies what is impure. It gives worth to what is worthless. It restores what is broken to bring blessing to the whole world. And we see that blessing here in chapter 2. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Now God's people have desecrated the temple, but what's the result of his judgment on them? Salvation, for the Lord's temple will be established. It will be raised high for all to see. The nations will stream to it. All nations will stream to it. Right? Isaiah 1. The nations are coming in, ransacking God's people. Isaiah 66. The nations flock to the mountain of the Lord. Now, as the new people of God. God uses the nations to come in and purge his people. So that once again, his people will be a blessing to all nations. God's people will be a blessing to the whole earth as the nations come in, not to plunder them, but to seek the temple. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and settle disputes for many peoples. And as we look at the salvation that comes from the Lord, we see that it increasingly takes the shape of Jesus. For Isaiah talks about judgment and salvation that increasingly takes the shape of Jesus. He is the word of the Lord who will return to judge. The one whose hands are bloodied so that ours can be made clean. The one who takes the full judgment of God on the cross so that we can have salvation forever. The one whom we the nations run towards. He is the one in whom we find peace and salvation. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. This is the good result of God's judgment. This is salvation for the nations. 
And so we run to the mountain of the Lord. We, the nations, run to Jesus. We gather around the new temple of the Lord. And we don't gather as outsiders, but as the new people of God. We run to Jesus, hating sin, trusting God, throwing ourselves on his mercy, looking to the mountain of the Lord. Knowing God has made us pure in his sight once and for all through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And now willing to have him purifying our lives while we wait to be perfect with him forever in heaven. Trusting him to get rid of the dross in our lives so that as a new people of God we can shine like our saviour and share his love with the world. Being generous with our money, our time and our energy. And trusting every day that God is good, even in the hard times. Trusting in his corrective work in our lives, resting in his forever judgment, throwing ourselves on his mercy, knowing he is good. For this is the message of Isaiah. God brings salvation through judgment, and the word of the Lord is good. my wife, Nick. Thank you, Nick, for that message, that overview and introduction. My name is Robin. If I haven't met you before, I might meet you afterwards. I'm going to lead us now in prayer. I'm going to read a portion of Psalm 46 to start with. God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and continue to praise you for the great love you have shown us in Jesus Christ our Lord, risen from the dead, And may our hearts and lives echo your praise now and always. As we continue to celebrate Christ's resurrection, increase our awareness of our... Sorry. As we continue to celebrate Christ's resurrection and increase our awareness of your blessings and renew a clean... that you will renew a clean spirit within, within us, that we may serve you in sincerity and truth through your mercy and grace. And we thank you for preserving throughout history a people for yourself, the remnant who have not bowed their knee to Baal. We bring to you in prayer today, you who are our refuge and strength, those who are suffering in Taiwan as a result of the earthquake. Please be with those who survived this disaster and minister to their needs of body, mind and spirit. Heal and help those who are injured, comfort and support the bereaved and strength to, and give strength to all who are working to bring relief and restore order. For the CMS staff and overseas mission fellowship staff and other Christian organisations, please help them to minister to people who may have been impacted by this disaster. And also we pray for those who have suffered through the recent rain and storms and flooding in our own state and in our own district. Please help them to restore order in, that, in their places that know damage now. And Father God, 
we give you thanks for our LMAP ministry team in their ministry to us and the community through Play Group, Go Jesus Club, Holiday Club and SRE Teaching. Strengthen them each day for the tasks that are on their to-do lists. And we thank you that Dave Swan and his family have been able to spend time in the UK and that they may have refreshment and make good memories. And for Gary, we thank you again, Father God, for his loving ministry to us and with us. And as he begins a new journey, may he know your grace and love in plentiful measure. Father, we also pray too for Nick and Ruth Hernshaw in Queensland. And we thank and praise you for the blessings of Good Friday and Easter Day combined services. And we ask now for good opportunities for Nick at the weekly soup kitchen night, for the short message he gives and that it may challenge those who hear. For good preparation for him preparing to speak at a men's breakfast in a week's time and good opportunities to speak Jesus to the men attending. We continue to ask you, Lord of the Harvest, to raise up more workers for the work of the Bush Church Aid Society across our nation. We bring before you Neville and Kathy Naden in this busy month of travel and meetings in South Australia, Northern New South Wales and the Northern Territory. Grant them travelling mercies and sustained strength as they meet with BCA field staff and spend time encouraging them. Heavenly Father, as we move into another week, we know there are members of our congregation who are facing painful situations. And we ask you today for Roy Winfield, having surgery tomorrow for ankle replacement, for Olga Prunty with chemo treatment commencing carrying on and for John Oakey hoping to come home after surgery. We ask Lord that you will give Roy and Denise peace that passes all understanding and assure comfort in you Lord God and that you will be with the, in the, with the surgeon's hands and mind as he operates. We give you praise that you hear our prayers and thank you now in anticipation that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and your kingdom come. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Robin. I wonder whether you've ever pondered on how blessed we are to live at this time in history. Uh, as Nick's been talking to us this morning, sharing from the book of Isaiah, the people of those, that time who, uh, who lived the lives they lived in so much disobedience, so much in their own desires, never really understood God's plan for salvation. And in fact, even the disciples, as they walked with Jesus, never really understood God's plan for salvation. I was only reading earlier this morning from the end of Luke, thinking about those last few days of Jesus before he went back to, to heaven to be with his father. And he said this to them as in these last hours, this is what I, what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. How blessed we are that we live in the era after Jesus, that we can understand and know where salvation lies, that the judgment that we've been talking about this morning has been cared for, paid for, looked after, taken away so that it doesn't matter whatever we have done or whatever we might do, it is covered by the blood of Jesus. What he did on the cross was to suffer, was to pay for our sin, whether it's already been done or whether it's going to be done, but it's covered by what God did in sending his son. 
So we come to our end of our time here. We will go out. I hope you can stay and enjoy morning tea. I really hope you can stay on until 12.30 uh, as we uh, farewell Gary, or more than farewell Gary, we say thanks to Gary for his ministry among us. But now if the music team would come up and we'll sing our final song, Only a Holy God. Thank you.